as long as the little blue line moves, we're good. But yesterday, cool. the blue line didn't work. All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, we're going to talk to you about how to get healthy fast by fasting. We're talking about therapeutic water only fasting that's medically supervised and a wonderful person that can help you do that is named Dr. Nathan Gershfeld. He was an intern and then a staff doctor at the True North Health Center. So he has lots of experience there as well as in your Belinda at his fasting escape retreat. Please welcome him to the show. Good to see you, Dr. Gershfeld. Good to see you, Chef AJ. And uh, I understand you're, you've now moved uh, and you're, I, you're a little I have. Further away from us now. And that is why I apologize to you for being a few minutes late. I did not get recognized in my community, but Bailey did apparently. And so somebody recognized <laughs> Bailey from YouTube and then they looked up the leash and goes, oh, you're Chef AJ. So I didn't want to be rude to the neighbors yet. I'm, I'm living in Northern California and I love it. It's, a, it, you know, it's, it's, you live in one place a long time. You forget there's other parts of the world. Well, you're a lot closer to Dr. Lyle. So I have to come and visit both of you. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. I hope Dr. Lyle will see me because um, I hear they're making me a surprise party, but I mean, I obviously I know about it because people that know me know Chef AJ does not like surprises. As, as, uh, as, as happy as I was to win the, the award from Vegetarian Summerfest to put, be put in the Vegan Hall of Fame, it was a surprise. And I do not like surprises. Just note to everyone, if you ever want to surprise me, tell me in advance. But anyway, hey, I don't know if you'll come up. Will you come up for the Chef AJ party that's uh, happening? Of course. I just have to know when it is. And I, I'm going to invite and, you because I'm hoping I'm hoping Dr. Lyle will come and I'll say, hey, but you know, Dr. Gershwell well, is coming. So yeah, maybe I can stop by Dr. Lyle's house and then drag him, drag him along with his. That would be amazing. Cat. I know that he's an introvert, <laughs> but it's it's anyway, it's, it's, it's been my first vegan party. But anyway, you know, fasting is such a, you know, it, it's really gained a lot of popularity just in the last 10 years since I first heard about it. Yeah, I was actually uh, recently in Florida just visiting and I pulled up to the gas station to, to fill up my rental car. And you know, in the gas stations, they have the little flat screens that have commercials. And I start hearing this commercial about fasting, intermittent fasting and whatnot. And I thought, oh my God, like nine years ago, 10 years ago, when I first got into practice, uh, I, it was like, I was talking about fasting, you know, when I was graduating school and they're like, what are you doing? This is crazy. You're going up to work at True North and interning at True North. What a waste of time. And, uh, and, and now it's like now on TVs and patients are calling me all the time, asking me about this type of fast or that type of fast for this type of condition. And now it's, it's just a lot more mainstream. And a lot of the credit, I think goes to the, the excellent job that Dr. Goldhammer did and the natural hygiene society you know, with the, the uh, Nat national health association that they did kind of pushing this information out. Dr. Goldhammer, you know, does these rich role interviews, the, the podcasts and you know, he's been such a wonderful spokesperson on this and has been doing it so long that now it's, it's just all over the, all over the news. Uh, I think the, the GQ magazine that had come out, uh, all the different podcasts, this is, I mean, it's really brought fasting to the forefront. Yeah. And let's not forget who got him on the ritual podcast. Uh, that was Jeff AJ. <laughs> 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 Trying to get Dr. Lyle on now. So we'll see. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and also you've been actually interviewing, you know, all these fasting people and the, the plant-based doctors. This is why you, you were, you got the, the vegan hall of fame is for, for pushing all this out to, to the mainstream. So let's not forget yeah, about that's what I, I want to be like the Don King promoting veganism. Absolutely. And speaking of the ritual podcast, Rich is my guest Friday at 11 for my 1000th episode where we're giving away a free Nutra milk machine. So please watch live. So you'll figure out how you can win that wonderful uh, machine. Wonderful. Yeah. I look forward to it. I cannot yeah. wait. Wow. So, you know, when you first went to true North, did you know about the fact that like they were reversing these chronic conditions that other people believe are lifelong when you first got there or you just thought it was, Hey, it's an interesting place. I'll do a, I'll do an internship here. Actually, I started off as a patient. So this was before the true North health center uh, building that, that if anybody has been at true North, you know, the building there, uh, this was before that this is a house in a smaller town called Pengrove. And my grandmother uh, told me about it because I'd been, uh, I had Hashimoto's and I had a thyroid tumor. Uh, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease. And then I had hypothyroidism and I had a thyroid tumor. And so I was really scared. I didn't know what any of those words meant. I just thought tumor was bad. It might be cancer. And I didn't know what thyroiditis was. I just, you know, autoimmune sounded really scary to me. So 
I ended up reading all about different fasting. So at the time there was no YouTube, there was barely internet information about fasting. It was all testimonials. It wasn't any real, real scientific investigation about it that I could find easily. I also hadn't been in practice at all. I hadn't done any schooling. It was more just, I was, I was an electrical engineer at the time. And I, in, in you know, my last year of school, I was starting to read all about this. And so when I graduated, uh, my grandma told me about this fasting clinic up in Northern California, and I had read something about fasting, read a few articles of Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyles, read a few of the NHA magazines or the mag- NHA articles on their website, uh, looked at the International Association of Hygienic Physicians, saw there was a few other doctors like Dr. Scott at the time, DJ Scott in, in Ohio, and read a lot of his articles. And then when I called Dr. Goldhammer, he said, oh yeah, what's your height, weight, asked me a bunch of questions. And and, uh, and he screened me, make sure I was a good candidate. And he says, yeah, you're a good candidate. Just come on up and, and you're probably, we probably need to do a 30 day fast with you. And so I was a little bit thinner than I am now. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll just do 30 days. And I went up there and, uh, and I started meeting people that are like, oh, I had this high blood pressure and it went away. I've had this autoimmune disease. I, me- I remember clearly a lady saying I had, have had a struggle with constipation my entire life. And I just did a 10 day fast. And now I'm like going to the bathroom three times a day. And uh, I, it does, it didn't sound weird to me because everybody was talking about their own health stuff, their bodily functions, but it was really actually fascinating just to see the patients themselves were just telling each other about, uh, they were spreading information amongst each other about how effective this was. Um, so I ended up doing about a five day fast. I kind of wimped out and, and, uh, I didn't eat that great beforehand. I did. I, it was a very tough fast <clears throat> and you know, based on everything I'd been reading on the internet, uh, it was supposed to be, I thought it was going to be a really fun experience. I'm going to get lighter and levitate and all these, all these things that you read that people will say about how the fast is supposed to go. And so, uh, and I didn't actually listen to Dr. Goldhammer when he said, it's going to be an intense and miserable experience. And sometimes you feel like you're going to die. So I thought, just thought to myself, gosh, well, I'm feeling this bad. Uh, let me just break the fast and, and then I'll, I'll be on the healthy diet. So uh, I snuck into their kitchen, ate a little apple, and then the next day they broke the fast with some watermelons and juice and some some fruit. And but what that did was actually I had been struggling quite a bit to eat a healthy diet before that, but that short fast helped me to break that cycle and get back on track. And that was what what really made my decision about what I wanted to do because I remember walking in there and thinking, wow, this is really cool that they've got <clears throat> they, they're actually helping people so much with this fasting process. And when I walked out, I was like, I want to do something like this. So that's when I, you know, uh, went through the whole thing to, to get into chiropractic school, uh, you know, did an internship at true North. So I did that, uh, about, about right before I started chiropractic school, I called Dr. Goldhammer up and I'd been taking the prerequisite classes, uh, for chiropractic. And I said, you know, I've got a few weeks before the semester starts. Can I come follow you around? I just want to know about this stuff. And this is, this is all I want to do. This is why I'm going to school for this. I don't, I'm not that interested in the adjusting part of it. I really want to do fasting and some sort of healthy, healthy, you know, natural hygiene approach. And he said, he said, yeah, sure. Why not? And, um, and we came, came in and that that's when I actually got a much more comprehensive uh, look at what I was happening with patients, because for the <clears throat> first time now, I wasn't listening to patients uh, from a friend's perspective, you know, just listening to them at the dining room table or in the living room. I was actually going around and seeing their medical history with the interns and the other doctors. And the doctors there were really helpful. The the doctors there were interns. So uh, Jennifer Daniels was one of the interns I was there at. um, And, uh, and she, uh, she basically was explaining to me all the different conditions. She was a medical doctor. She explained to me what was going on. I would sit in on Dr. Sultana's consults and whenever he had time, he would kind of explain here and there. And then when Dr. Clapper came on staff as well, same thing. And so I, I remember meeting my first lupus patient and tell, she was telling me how she's on day 20 of her fast. She's off her medications and she's feeling great. And she's got a little bit of stiffness, but nowhere near what she had for 30 years of lupus. <clears throat> remember, uh, I remember a, a gentleman who had a, uh, a large prostate. And, and I, he got the blood test back after his short fast and his prostate, his PSA, which isn't the best measurement, but it's the only one they had at the time. But his PSA went down significantly. He was running up and down, jumping, screaming, hugging us interns because he was so happy. So the, I, I did this internship and I started going back and forth uh, to True North during my schooling in between, uh, in between and during the breaks. And then uh, about uh, halfway through my school, Dr. Goldhammer and I were uh, developing a much closer mentor mentee relationship. And he said, well, w- when you're done with school, I really want to hire you or have you come on staff somehow. 
So we ended up doing that. And I finished up my semester, my last semester at True North and joined the staff there and was there for almost three years uh, working, supervising patients. And then uh, I, the plan was always, I told Dr. Goldemar, I want to start my own center or somehow run my own center and help people with fasting. So that was the plan. So, so he really, you know, was incredible, uh, generous about, you know, teaching me, uh, some of the ways that he screens people out and what to watch for. And so when it became the right time, I moved down to Southern California, uh, started my outpatient practice, and then eventually started my, the fasting escape retreat center, which was a large house. Uh, which is a large house currently where people come in, they stay and they do water fasting under my supervision. So that's, that's kind of the story. Um, and now I kind of uh, forgot the original question you, you, you told me, I know. I've oh, been, um, did, yeah. did, 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 when you started working there, did you know that, that, that these chronic diseases of lifestyle that people say they can do nothing about that they have to take medication for the rest of their life, like diabetes and autoimmune disease could actually be reversed through water only fasting? Yeah. So there we go. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm get, getting, get, I kind of forgot the question and it's okay. <laughs> went off into a long story. I'm, I'm learning from Dr. Lyle. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I got there at b- both as a patient and then as an intern, uh, and then as a staff doctor. So that's been a really cool thing to watch is to, to have people reverse many chronic diseases, uh, mostly due to lifestyle excess. It's amazing. That is so amazing. So I'm guessing when you first came to True North, you weren't vegetarian or vegan, or were you? I was. When I first got my diagnosis of what was going on with me, my grandmother uh, was very was pushing me, uh, saying, "You got to stop eating animal products. You've got to stop eating junk food." Was really the main thing, and really the only way I was eating, you know, animal products was through junk food means. So it's not like I was you know, catching some, some animal food, steaming it, you know, putting it on top of steamed vegetables or whatnot. No, it was like burgers and fries and things like that. So, so for me, cutting out the animal foods, cut out all the processed foods. And what was left was, you know, a plant-based or at that point it was a vegan diet, um, going to true North and doing this, then, you know, understanding the actual natural hygiene approach, uh, meant that, that not only did I go vegan, but I actually went plant-based meaning like minimally processed vegan, you know, plant meals. So rather than French fries, which are vegan, and rather than like kale chips and all these other things that were fried and have a bunch of salt in them, it was more plant-based. Yeah. So Dr. Will B was on the show on Monday and he was talking about the microbiome and Kathy wanted to know how, what effect does fasting have on the microbiome? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. So <clears throat> what we have to keep in mind is first, when, we, when we're actually eating food, you're, the food that you're eating is feeding the bacteria in your gut. And depending on what you're eating, you may actually have some byproducts uh, that when you digest the food, it can affect your gut as well. And so when you fast, you end up not feeding the gut bacteria at all. And the gut bacteria uh, starts to die off a little bit. However, when you start to refeed the body, now you're actually feeding the body some good foods and that will go in and recolonize the, the good bacteria. So it's, you know, I, I, I look at these questions in the sense that they are a little bit piecemeal, that it's not just about the microbiome. It's not just about the fasting. What we want to look at is the totality of the, of the entire, uh, of the entire lifestyle, which is eating a healthy diet, doing some fasting as needed. Uh, but, but as far as recolonizing the good, the good bacteria that happens as a result of a healthy diet and lifestyle, particularly after the fast. Nice. You know, wh- when you talk about fasting, people need to know that it's really important that it be medically supervised, right? Because I, I mean, I've heard, I actually had a guy on the show that lost a lot of weight, but he fasted on his own for 42 days at home. Mm-hmm. But that's not really recommended, is it? Well, the general recommendation is that if you're doing a longer fast than say three to five days, you want to have some help. Okay. And, and this is, this is why, okay. So there's going to be people out there all the time that will do it on their own without any advice, without any supervision. And that's fine. That's, that's definitely, you know, their, their freedom to do so. Okay. But the, the, uh, the, the attitude that I take is that if we're going to do something where we're, we're, we're disrupting the body's normal natural processes, and we're, we're getting into a state where, where there might be some risks, then it's good to have a complete picture. And the complete picture is getting some baseline information like, your blood work. How does your kidney doing? How are your liver? How's your liver doing? How are your enzymes doing? Um, how is your electrolytes doing? So if you start off the fast very sick, for example, and, uh, and you start fasting, we don't actually know if you're too sick to fast or if there's going to be problems down the road. Now that doesn't mean some people can do it and some people will do it. It just means that when you do do it, uh, you're exposing yourself to risk. 
And so the risks are not like, like, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not like you're, you're exposing yourself to risk. Like if you are rollerblading and you don't have, you know, elbow pads, it's like rollerblading. You don't have a helmet that if you do fall, you're going to really hurt yourself. And so it, you know, the main risks for, for kind of flying blind is you don't know when things are going right and you should keep pushing yourself through the fast and you, or you don't know when things are going wrong and that it feels bad and you should actually stop the fast. So it just gives us more information when we do it on a supervised way. Now, the other thing is that, you know, if I'm going to play soccer, uh, I'm going to hire a soccer coach if I want to get really good at soccer and if I want to do it right. And so that's, that's where supervision comes in is you really want to get, it, it's a good idea to get help if you want to do a longer fast. If you do a short fast, that's not a big deal. The other issue is being on medications. So in today's world, we are, the average person is taking five to seven prescription medications. And when you're older, it's even more than that. So uh, there's certain medications where you really don't want to be fasting because they are toxic, they are harmful. And that effect is potentiated, meaning it's, it's magnified when you're fasting. So we really want to make sure that we do it in a, in, in a safe, as safe a way as possible. So every so often I have some patients who are doing a fast and they want to be doing a lot of activity and they want to be going around and doing, doing a lot of things during fasting. And, and that really does skew their, their fast. It makes it a little less safe. They can pass out. They don't know what's going on. Other people don't want to do blood work. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that are inconvenient, but what we try to do is do it as safely as possible. Now, as far as the, the guidelines go, yeah, we really want to do a good job so that we don't cause people to be afraid of fasting just because if somebody dies, for example, or some, some problem happens, then now you've got patients that might be scared of fasting, even though they might need to fast. So we want to be careful not to, not to, uh, not to, not to, not to expose yourself to more risk than you need. Absolutely. So there are some people that sh shouldn't fast. They need to know that mm -hmm. who they are. Right. So the, the, the main kind of general gist of it is if you fear fasting, if you don't want to fast, you think that something's going to go wrong. That's the main indicator. You shouldn't be fasting. So it need, you need to have a, 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 your own understanding that the fasting is the right move in this case. Okay. The other, uh, there's other medical conditions where you don't want to be fasting. Okay. One is if you're on medications other than say thyroid medication or some hormones. Okay. Uh, certain medications are just toxic and that effect is just magnified. So we want to avoid that. And so this is where if patients come to me, whether it's through the, the remote fasting or through the, the at-home fasting and they're on medications, then we do one of two things. We either work with their medical doctor, okay. In their location or here, you know, locally and, and see if the doctor is willing to actually reduce the medications while we work on them with diet. If they're willing to do that before they fast and that's perfect. If they're not willing to do that, uh, or maybe the doctor has no experience, then uh, my medical director, Dr. Renee Thomas, which we'll, we'll have on next week, uh, will work, uh, she'll work with the patients to, to uh, reduce the medication or give them advice as to how to tell their doctor uh, how to reduce the medications in, in preparation for this water fast. And so we do, we do, that's exactly what we do. And I think that's, that's a very safe way to, to, to approach this. Um, so we, we really, we want to make sure that, that if they're on medications, we're, we're really careful. The other kind of other health conditions that can be, can be contraindicated to fasting is type one diabetes. We don't really want to fast somebody uh, because we don't know the effects uh, with, you know, with insulin uh, and taking people off of insulin. We really want to avoid that. Um, in fact, the only death during fasting that I, that I know of, uh, uh it was actually a, a, a case, a court case where somebody who didn't have any clinical training fasted somebody, uh, without, uh, and they took them off diabetes and they end up dying. So, um, that, that was an unfortunate tragedy that didn't have to happen. Um, the other, uh, kind of conditions could be things like arrhythmias, heart, heart, pal um, heart arrhythmias, where your beats, not uh, where your heart rate's not regular. So there's a few other conditions there, but kidney, you know, extreme kidney failure. So chronic kidney failure, uh, could be a contraindication to fasting as well. So, but in any of those cases, we might not necessarily do water fasting. We might do some juice fasting or some broth or some combination of healthy food, uh, or, or broth and water and, and juice. But type one diabetics cannot fast, correct? correct? Correct. Yeah. If you're type one diabetic, the, the best thing you can do is to uh, visit masteringdiabetes.org and, uh, and, and do Robbie and Cyrus's program. And that's a really excellent like coaching service to, to help you learn what it is that you need to do to, to improve your blood sugar control. Great. Thank you. Live viewer is asking, can fasting help with diverticulosis? 
Yeah. So let me just explain to other people. Diverticulosis is the process where you have, uh, you can have some pouches in your gut where, where you are eating food and there you can have some, some pouches in your, in your large intestine that can, uh, and if they inflames, it's called diverticulitis. So our main strategy for, for fasting is we're actually trying to get the body to heal itself. Okay. And do it without any uh, impedance. Okay. So, so without the, without having to be bogged down by digestion. So yeah, what we, our strategy for diverticulosis is to eat a very clean diet. Maybe raw foods wouldn't be that, that would be too painful. Uh, but we eat some really well steamed vegetables and we, uh, we do this in, in, to begin a fast. We do a short fast, maybe a long fast, depending on what other issues are going on. And then we resume the, the resume the healthy diet. So it's a very simple approach, uh, to, to, to treating these types of things. Now, uh, again, fasting is not a cure for diverticulosis. It's not a cure for anything. What it is, it's a management strategy where we're letting the body take over and we're really following the body's advice. It's essentially what the body's telling us, which is sometimes we just need to take a big break. Right. Well, when you say fasting is not a cure for diverticulosis, it's not a cure for anything. If mm -hmm. people continue the same lifestyle habits after the fast, right? Exactly. And diet's not a cure. The body's the one that's fixing it. You're just giving it the right fuel. Absolutely. Here's a question from Misty. Would water fasting help with high blood pressure? Is there such a thing to reverse high blood pressure? Yeah. So water in, in Dr. Goldhammer's study, this was, this was uh, many years ago, uh, showed that actually a blood pressure actually is uh, it can be reversed stage one, two, and three high blood pressure can be reversed. If we do a health promoting diet and a water only fast. So this was the largest, uh, effect size ever shown in the scientific literature. And in my practice, I've been in practice for 10 years and, and almost, uh, I've almost never seen a patient with high blood pressure, not get some benefit from water fast and a healthy diet. So what we would want to do is actually evaluate you to make sure that it's actually about blood, high blood pressure and not any other issue, like, a, some other kidney problem or something else. Uh, and, and then we, we do a healthy diet and a water fast, and we're going to watch this blood pressure improve uh, over time. Now, depending on how long you've had it, what medications you're on, we, there may be, there may need to be a few other things like doing a medical evaluation ahead of time to look at the medications, um, eat the diet ahead of time bef uh, before we start the fast. But uh, in essence, what we do is we fast you long enough to get the body to reduce that blood pressure. Yep. Great. So this question, you pretty much answered, what are some potential patient issues that would prevent you from doing the water fast? But I like to thank the person for posting a question. And Cindy says, I did a 23 day water fast. My numbers were excellent, blood pressure, blood sugar. However, within two weeks of stopping the fast, even though I ate mostly whole food plant-based and no SOS, all the numbers increased again and the weight came back on. How do you maintain after a fast? I want to know what mostly means. That, that's a really good question. And that's exactly where my mind went because uh, it's, it, this is not an accusation at all for, for, for this lady. Is it Misty who asked that question? Huh? Um, it's that, that we don't actually know what mostly means. Okay. Mostly for one person can mean mostly for most completely something different for somebody else. Okay. However, after a fast, your body's pretty sensitive. Okay. So you can actually, if you add in, uh, you know, some salt in your body, the blood pressure can go up. Okay. If you add in some processed refined foods or some animal products right after a fast, your blood sugars can go up. When you fast, your insulin levels are lower. And so if you add in some processed foods right after you break a fast, your blood sugar is going to go up. Okay. You're also going to, you, when you do a water fast, you actually are losing extra water from the extra salt that you had before the fast. And so you put in some salt in your diet right after the water fast, you're going to gain some weight, some, sometimes five or six pounds. In fact, that's one of the ways I know when I'm talking to people on the, the, um, on the phone is when they finish fasting and I, you know, I, I, I advise them, you know, don't put any salt in your diet, you know, for, for a while. And then the next day we check their vitals and all of a sudden their, their weight has shot up two pounds in one day. And it's like, okay, we did, what did you add to your diet? Oh, just a little bit of salt. Okay. So there we go. Now your body has retained more water than normal because you've added in something right after this fast. So, so here's how we get back on track. Okay. In general, I've been finding that, that if you're completely off track, you might need to do a water fast, but if you just did a fast and you don't want to do another one and you're, you've been kind of mostly plant-based, I would actually start, you know, make a plan to go fully plant-based. Okay. For the next say 10 meals, whenever you start. Okay. You might be 10 meals away from being back on track. 
And we will actually start to see these numbers increase or improve uh, after just these 10 meals. Okay. That's, that's our strategy to this, but sticking on this diet is, is make no mistake. It's the most difficult thing anybody can do. I, I've had many patients who have lots of time, lots of resources, lots of motivation, and they still struggle because what we have is an unnatural process called the pleasure trap where you're, you're, there's a mismatch between your brain and the environment. Okay. You're not designed to be living in proximity to all this fast food and then expect to not go after it. Okay. So you're, you're going to be naturally normally craving and being around these types of things. And it's, it's like an alcoholic that, that gets sober for a year and a half and then starts working as a bar hop. Okay. We know in principle, it's only a matter of time before they have a bad day, they have a breakup, they got the bad traffic, they're stressed. And then all of a sudden now they got some cravings sneaking in. Okay. Now, if somebody did make it through that experience and they didn't have any alcohol at all, what we would tell them is, wow, that's surprising. Okay. That's really cool. That's really impressive. Okay. But normally we wouldn't expect somebody to be in proximity to all these things. So that's why one of the number one things I tell to people when they're done fasting, especially on the remote fasting program is what chef AJ says. If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. So you've got to clean up your environment to give yourself the best chance possible to, to improve uh, your, your overall lifestyle after the fast. Yeah. Thank you. Here, here's a good question. I've never heard it phrased this way before from Liz. What are the principles behind water fasting? How does it work? And I, I, how does it work really? Yeah. Well, there's a lot more that's no, that's not known than there is that is known. Okay. So I'm going to give you the philosophical kind of idea of water fasting. Okay. So what we actually are looking at, let's imagine you cut your hand. Okay. If you cut your hand, now you have an open wound and if you actually go to the doctor, they're actually, they're going to look at it. They might give you antibiotics and they're going to stitch it up. Okay. And when they stitch it up, they're going to tell you to go home, rest it, don't move it and let it heal on its own. Okay. Now, if you go and you actually irritate it, then now they're going to, you're going to be creating an obstacle to your body to heal itself. And you have to go back every time you do that. And they're going to have to restitch it up and maybe put more antibiotics on it. So <clears throat> let's see what they actually did. They didn't actually heal the cut. They simply set up the right conditions so that your body can heal itself. Okay. And <clears throat> this is what we recognize with the body is the body can heal itself of almost everything. If we give it the right conditions. Okay. So, <clears throat> and now if you create obstacles in that conditions, if you irritate it, now it's going to have problems. Okay. So now let's look at what the, the standard American diet or standard, you know, first world diet would be. Okay. It's high in animal foods. It's high in oils, animal products, refined products, uh, processed foods, refined carbohydrates. It's got low exercise, low sunlight, too much stress in terms of conflicts of interests. Uh, and it's got alcohol, caffeine, salt, sugar, oil, flour, dairy products. Okay. All of these things bog down your body. Okay. And prevent it. It's an obstacle for your body to heal as quickly as it needs to be. So we all know in principle, if you say you know, broke your arm and then you, then you had to, uh, you know, you had, were insomnia for three days and you didn't sleep all that well, you drank a bunch of alcohol. You could actually slow down the healing of that arm being healed. But if you ate really well, slept really well, you could actually heal that bone faster. We know this. Now we're actually getting to the details of if we change our diet, then we can actually heal things. We can reverse heart disease. <clears throat> Sorry about that. We can reverse heart disease. We can reverse many other diseases. So where fasting comes in, so where fasting comes in is actually that now we're actually removing all the food and all the digestion from the body to let it focus on the healing that needs to be done. So the way I've kind of thought about this is if you have a major factory and the factory has been processing orders for your entire life, okay, it's processing orders, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And in every order, there's a little bit of debris that falls down on the floor. There's a little bit of debris that gunks up the machine uh, while it's being processed. And now it's just getting slower and slower because there's so much debris everywhere. And now the boss is going to come in and say, you know what, we're actually going to stop processing orders just for a little bit, uh, but you guys are still working. And so in that time, we're actually going to sweep the floor, clean the machines, open them up, do some maintenance. And then when you do all that, now we start processing orders and it's a lot more efficient. 
Okay, the floor is clean. The house is, you know, the 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 corners, the cobwebs are off the the the, the corners. All the machines and the gears are all now clean, and now the orders get processed better. So that's kind of how I think of it uh, philosophically with fasting. Now, there's a number of investigations that are currently and have done being done. Some of the investigations are on cells, bacteria, viruses, what happens when you deprive them of food. There's a lot of interesting things there, and it's kind of a biomechanical or biochemical explanation for it. But those don't interest me as much as watching patients actually get better, because there's a number of patients, almost every patient that I have that either does the, the at-home thing or the remote fasting thing is they tell me, oh, yeah, I'm coming in for, you know, I, I got some high blood pressure. I want to reduce it. And as the fast goes on, they say, well, my blood pressure is improving, but you know what else is happening is my joints move better. Okay. I had a lady who had, uh, she had COVID. So she had that long haul COVID symptoms where she said before her fast began, she couldn't even walk out to the mailbox without huffing and puffing. And she's on, you know, 11 days into this water fast and, and we're talking on the phone every day, making sure she's okay. And she said, you know, I went out to the mailbox and I've like, I'm breathing just fine. And she, 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 and this continued through her fat, the rest of her fast and her refeed period as well, where she was doing just fine. So really shows us the, the healing power of the body when everything gets out, when we get out of the way is incredible. Yep. That's wonderful. Let's see. I just saw a question from Mary Beth after a fast. What is the best first meal? You don't really eat after the fast, you juice after the fast. Yeah, right? yeah we do. And we do a few things. Um, it, it, we do uh, some sort of fruit juice uh, or some broth. Uh, and then we, we phase that in uh, with, uh, with some solid foods. So fruits and vegetables, cooked vegetables. It's on a case by case basis because somebody who might have some gut issues may need a different refeed than somebody who doesn't have gut issues. So we, we do have some gentle refeed uh, strategies for that too. But in general, yeah, we go with some juice first and then some solid food and then more concentrated food as we keep going. Thanks. Uh, do you know if bean sprouts should be eaten steamed or raw? Uh, I, I, would, I would always tend towards eating something that I don't know too much about steamed. <laughs> that makes sense. That's oh, funny. <laughs> Tiffany says I'm a type two diabetic and I want to fast because I've been having digestive issues, mainly because I've started eating animal products after I went plant-based for 10 weeks on the chip plan, but I finished the plan and have fallen off the plan due to moving. I just moved. I didn't fall off my plan. Just saying, uh, fell off my schedule. I'm teasing you by the way, my sugar has gone up a little. My weight has gone up. I'd like to do a few days fasting. Is that possible? Yes. Uh, so, so we now can see the cause and effect. So when you get off the plan and you start eating more animal foods, then your blood sugar goes up. So that's a really important uh, thing that she's realized uh, because what I, what I try to impart to people I work with is, is we don't want to use the fast like it's an aspirin. Okay. Like take three, take a three day fast and then that'll cure you. And then I can go back to doing that. So I'm really pleased and glad that she's made that connection. So the next step is, is where, where a short fast can come into play is what we call break the cycle. Okay. Very often, even if no matter how hard we try for some people, it just is that addictive where we just cannot get back on track. And so if that's the case, then breaking the cycle completely without any food decisions at all for a few days, whether it's two, three days or six or seven days or longer, depending on, you know, how long you can take off of life, uh, that may be very useful as uh, uh, provided that we have a very excellent refeed afterwards. So yeah, I'd encourage her to, to reach out to me and we can, we can design something that, that might fit. And that way we can, we can get her back on track. Yeah. Because you can do this remotely now mm -hmm. safely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nice. Hey, you know, I forgot to tell you, I wore these earrings just for you. I don't know if you can tell what this is, but it's the chemical symbol of something that you know a lot about. Let me, uh, hey, let, let me, me take it. Maybe off. it's water. I don't know. No, it's actually not water. I can't see it at all. Shoot. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. That okay. looks like an organic chemistry figure of something. I don't know. Is it an amino acid? I, I actually it's have dopamine. <laughs> Somebody, my friend, Tim gave me dopamine earrings. Isn't that cool? That's, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, that's a, that's kind of like the principle behind the pleasure trap, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's, this is, this is going to be uh, that's going to be key for people. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I think I think learning about the pleasure trap, I think, is the most important thing for everyone that has a chronic or even, you know, not a chronic condition, but th- it struggles with right. eating and weight and, and 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 disease. Right, right. Uh, and it's great because th- I mean, this is also why we, with my remote fasting thing, we're, we're actually doing classes, you know, once, twice a week of different different topics. So people are, don't just have to do the fast and they're, they're thrust in the world afterwards. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there's somebody that doesn't understand that fasting is just water only because they're asking, do you recommend electrolytes during a fast? Yeah. So in general, we, we want to do a fast where it's a pure water fast, unless we modify it with a whole plant food, like a juice or a broth. Okay. And here's the reason your body's a very complex organism. And the minute we start adding in one thing, then the other thing we got it, we end up chasing electrolytes. So if you're fasting and for example, you start adding salt, well, then now maybe your body needs more potassium and then you add in potassium. Well, maybe it now needs more magnesium and now maybe it needs more, more phosphorus. And so you end up chasing these electrolytes around and just even in a hospital setting, uh, it's very difficult to manage uh, because things happen very quickly. And so it's a lot easier to do water fasting only uh, when you're doing it. And then if you need to modify it, we do it with a whole food like, like juice. So that's our preference. The other thing to keep in mind is we're really trying to do it as safely as possible. So you might meet people, you might see some YouTubers out there that'll do a fast and will take salt or they'll exercise or whatever it is. And that's all fine. I, you know, again, people have the freedom to do whatever they want. The, the problem is, is as a clinician, I look at data, I look at literature. And in the only cases in literature where people had adverse events, like arrhythmias and kidney damage and other problems, it's where they were adding all these other things during their water fast. And so as a general recommendation, we don't do that kind of fasting. Uh, We don't recommend it. And, you know, when I work with people remotely, sometimes people will ask me, they really want to put it, they really want to do that, but it's a lot easier if we just get some blood work to show, oh no, you're, you're feeling miserable because you're fasting, not because you're actually low in electrolytes. And so that's, that's what we, you know, that's, that's my stance on electrolytes. Some people do it anyway, uh, but don't really recommend it. Yeah. So I was actually going to ask you something because uh, someone contacted me yesterday that her husband was just diagnosed with stage four melanoma and that he's seeing an alternate practitioner that's giving him a bone broth fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, my understanding is bone broth is fairly toxic. Well, yeah, you're dealing with the animal products in there and also salt. Uh, most bone broth that I've read about has salt in it. And so now we're doing exactly the different. It's, it's not really a water fast. It's some sort of modified fast. Um, I don't know if some bone broths add in some extra fat or some salt or oil or whatever it is. Um, I even had somebody who was trying to do bone broth, but they were putting in ghee, which is clarified butter into their, into their uh, thing. Um, so ended up actually convincing them not to do that. But uh, generally speaking, uh, it's, it, I'm sorry for your friend who has this uh, stage four melanoma. Um, there is some literature on non-humans where they do some fasting and, and maybe it can help uh, make the chemotherapy more effective. I'm not sure I've seen anything on melanoma itself with fasting, but if they are going to do a water fa- uh, some sort of fast, I'd, I'd just say you know, it's better to do water fast only. It's a less complicated, but sometimes people want to do something because they don't want to lose as much weight. But my attitude is also that when you add in things besides water, you actually slow down ketosis and you actually will increase your muscle loss too because of that. So we try not to do that uh, if we, if we don't have to. Yes. Um, Let's see. That makes sense. May says, what's the best water to drink on a water fast? And then you might also say, what's the best water to drink in general? I I recommend distilled water. And so this is where sometimes people say, well, doesn't it leach minerals from, from your body? And that's not true. I've been drinking distilled water. I've been supervising patients drinking distilled water. True North has supervised patients drinking distilled water for 30, 40 day fast. And nothing, nothing like that happens. Um, so, you know, people have reverse osmosis filters. Those are the ones I recommend, but with the remote patients, I'll, I'll have them actually pick up, uh, distilled water from the grocery store, or they have it delivered and they get all their water uh, for their entire fast all at once. So they have to go back and forth and they can be at rest, but distilled water is really just hydrogen oxygen. How distillation works is you boil water and distilled water is the steam that comes up after you boil water. And so all the impurities, anything that might be, uh, not water in the, in, in that will actually be too heavy to rise up in the water vapor. And so it's the purest form of water that there is. Great. Thank you. And how often can one do a water fast? 
That is a good question. It's also on a case by case basis. So if we do a long fast with somebody, I just uh, recently uh, had a, a, uh, a few people who want to do a follow up fast. They did a fast, you know, three months ago, another person did it about six months ago, and they want to do another fast because they're, uh, they were still they, they had to break the fast for work reasons. And then they they were able to stick on the diet, not so much, but you know, tried their best. Uh, but then they want to do another follow-up fast. So now what we want to do is evaluate them to see if that's going to that's going to be safe. So we get blood work done, uh, we you know do some sort of examination, some consultation to make sure how they're feeling, uh, what length of fast they're going to do. Uh, but I'm kind of sensing in your question that maybe you're thinking that that oh is it good that you're you're hoping or wondering if I'm thinking oh is a 24-hour fast once a week or once a month helpful or maybe a three-day fast every five uh, every three months or a 10-day fast once a season whatever it is so I've actually heard things like that and I've seen people try this I don't actually have an official position on it because I think it's really dependent on what the person's doing in their life. Okay, so let's actually go from one extreme to the other. Okay, on one extreme, we have someone like Chef AJ, Dr. Goldhammer, or, uh, or somebody who's really doing a very excellent job with their diet. Okay, and so we're going to expect that they're not going to have too many reasons to do a water fast other than just maybe they get run down, they need to do, do a rest, which they could in, in principle do without water fasting. But let's suppose now they want to do a water fast once a year. Totally fine, no big deal either way. Now on one extreme, we might, on the other extreme, we might have somebody that eats fast food all the time, doesn't exercise, is several you know, dozen pounds overweight, is on multiple medications. And now they're, they're considering, well, what should I do as far as fasting? Okay. And the answer would actually be to, to slowly change your lifestyle or rapidly change your lifestyle, whatever can, can happen. And then incorporate fasting in there maybe as a tool to help keep you on track. So for example, sometimes it can help that if you get do a fast, get on track, and now just your lifestyle, your taste buds, everything just starts, you know, three months later, that starts to wane a little bit. And you start to feel like, oh gosh, I'm craving the other stuff and all the, the, the bland food or the food without so much, so much salt in this tasting kind of bland. Well, then it might make sense to do another fast in three to six months where now you kind of get another rest and reboot, uh, or maybe you actually do fall off the plan quite a bit. And so you do a periodic fast to get you back on track. So those are kind of different perspectives there. Um, and so my general attitude is, is we don't want to use fasting as a medicate, like, like it's a medication. Okay. Like we, we eat bad. And so we're going to fast the next day. Okay. What I would instead do is we use fasting as part of a healthy lifestyle in order to give your body the rest that it deserves when it needs it. So uh, how one way that you can know if you might need to water fast is if you sit down and you eat a plate of food that has no salt, no sugar, no oil in it. So like plain potatoes, plain broccoli, steamed broccoli, a plain salad, uh, bowl of beans, whatever. And if that without any salt in it, without any oil, butter, if that doesn't taste really good, then perhaps you need a fast to get your taste buds adjusted. Yeah, that's one of the ways that we can tell. Another way could also be if you have high blood pressure, if you've got type two diabetes, if you've got an autoimmune disease, if you've got joints that prevent you from moving freely, that may also be a reason to do so. But as far as regular fasting goes, that's going to be a completely uh, individual decision. Uh, and so I don't think it's known that a, that it's healthier or not healthier to do a once a week fast, but it can definitely give your body a nice break if it needs it. Yeah. Thank you. Here is a question that I bet you get often and where it is from Linda is water fasting beneficial for dealing with cancer. Yeah, it's a good question. And I know since I did the uh, Chris work interview, uh, that I've had a lot more interest, uh, with, 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 uh, with fasting and cancer. And so what I, what I have to say about this is that there's, there's the only documented evidence that we have of a particular cancer being, uh, you know, being reversed essentially, uh, through fasting is with the, the true North health center, uh, true North health foundation. Uh, we had a patient who did, uh, who had stage three lymphoma and she did a 21 day water fast. Then she had a three year follow up and a post CT scan showed that there was no more evidence of this cancer. Uh, and so I know that that's not the same thing as other cancers. Okay. Um, however, that said, we do know that there's a few mechanisms of, can of fasting that can affect certain tumor markers and certain growth factors. So for example, we know that a factor called insulin-like growth factor does 
uh, when it's higher, uh, tumor growth actually increases. And that we know now that that uh, marker goes down when, uh, when, when you fast, both during and after a fast. And so that's useful to know that if you, if you were trying to you know, affect your cancer and say you were set for chemotherapy, it may help uh, in terms of getting your body a little bit healthier and maybe it might potentially improve uh, some, some markers, but we just don't know enough to kind of definitively say, so my general attitude is, is if you've got some, you know, cancer and, and you've, you've, you know, I would still talk to your doctors and see what they think it might be worth it to do a fast. If you needed to get back on track, if you're not eating all that healthy, but it's really early to say that it can cure or even, you know, affect cancer positively. Um, I know I recently had a lady who, um, she was actually stuck in Canada because of the, all the lockdowns last, this was about a year or so. A uh, year and a half or so, um, and she had lymphoma, and she was like, I, "I I can't leave, and so I can't go to Fasting Escape or True North, so I need to do a fast." So I worked with her. We did a fast. She did an MRI after this fast, and her lymphoma got incredibly better. She didn't actually have enough time to do a long enough fast, but she got enormous results, you know, amazing results from this. Okay, I've had patients who had you know stage three, stage four prostate cancer, and their PSA goes down. Okay. But that's not the same as cancer getting cured or cancer getting improved because there really isn't a lot of data on there, but we do know that certain tumor markers do improve, uh, with, uh, with fasting. Nice. Uh, Mary Beth says how much water per day does one drink on a water fast? Yeah, it varies somewhere between half to a full gallon of water per day. And sometimes a little bit more if, if someone gets really, really thirsty, but we try to keep it as a minimum of half a gallon. Wow. Cool. All right. I saw something here. Oh, from Struthel, water fasting COVID, yay or nay? Uh, question is, is the question, uh, is it during COVID or after you get COVID? I guess that's what I want to know. Now I had COVID in December of 2020. Um, and I first thought it was just, I was just getting sick because I, you know, I wasn't eating all that great for a few days. And I thought I was just, you know, getting sick from that, but it turns out I had COVID and I lost my sense of taste and smell, but I fasted for five days when I had the, co when I had COVID had a high fever. So, um, my general attitude is if you get sick and you don't feel like eating, don't force yourself to eat. Uh, but if you have, if you had COVID before, and now you have symptoms because of that, uh, perhaps I, I've been seeing patients, uh, call me up for that. And as a side thing, we do fasting and their symptoms do improve. Nice. So here's a comment by, where did it go? By, I, I can't see the tr tried and true. I thought Dr. Greger says over fasting slows metabolism long-term. Does it? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I don't know. Long-term, uh, it, it's going to depend highly on what diet you're eating. Okay. And how much activity level, uh, you're engaging in afterwards. So, uh, what we in general recommend is a whole plant foods diet. That's low in salt, low in sugar, low in oil, low in coffee, low in flour, low, low in alcohol, basically low in fun, all the, all the good things that you enjoy. So, um, but when you fast and you, you deprive your taste buds of any type of stimulation, they actually get quite sensitive. And so it doesn't feel like you're giving up all that much. Uh, when you're done fasting. And so, yeah, well, there are some effects and, and there can sometimes be uh, this, this voracious appetite right after a fast, uh, but, but we, we can control that uh, by eating whole plant foods. And that's what we want to stick with. And so when that happens, we're not so concerned with the, 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 the metabolism and the, uh, yeah, the, the, the slower metabolism. Yep. Marta says, what do you think of Kangen water? I don't know too much about it. I recommend a, some sort of pure distilled water. That's all fine. Okay. Let's see. If somebody wants to work with you, they just go to the Fasting Escape website and mm -hmm. fill out the form? Yep. They just go to the Fasting Escape website. So, so I, I had a Fasting Escape retreat center, which is where I am right now. And what, what happened was during COVID, so I, when I first moved in here and started Fasting Escape, this was almost five years ago. Uh, was we had, uh, we had a, a lease and to the house and that's where I started fasting escape. And, uh, the plan was actually to, uh, start the fasting escape, then move out to a bigger facility and then, uh, and then expand from there. Uh, but then COVID hit. And so, uh, what, what, what would end up happening was I had patients that were coming here, uh, that were that were willing to take the risk of traveling and going to another place. Cause they were, you know, everybody, you know, both sides of the aisle, they, they all, everybody struggles with the pleasure trap and everybody, almost everybody struggles with health issues in today's world. So on one hand, I had people that were coming here and wanted to fast and they were willing to, to come here and, 
be in a house with other people and, and, uh, and, and fast. On the other hand, I had many patients that were calling me and telling me that, listen, I, I don't want to leave. I don't want to take the risk of you know, flying on a plane across the country or driving and, or being around people here that they don't know who they are, whether or not they're sick or not. So uh, a lot of people were, were struggling. So I felt very, very, uh, I felt like, like you, you can't really just leave those people <laughs> leave those people being sick. Cause, uh, so what we actually did is, is, and that plus there were also people that were trapped into other countries. Like I said, I mentioned Canada, there was also other countries that they couldn't leave. Um, and so, so they called me up and, and we started doing this remote fasting just to see what it was like and see how people did. And people have been doing great. One of the, the number one comments that people have told me is that when they do the refeed at home, they actually love it because they actually get the hands-on practice after the fast. And so when they're done fasting, they now have the habits, they're, they're kind of got that momentum going. And, and this was people that had come here to fasting escape before, and they tried the fasting program at home. And they said that they would come home after their fast. And they're like, okay, now what? Like what, what, now I'm at an empty fridge, empty house. And I don't know, they just don't have the momentum. But when we'd work with them after the fast to do the refeed, now they're, they're telling me that, oh yeah, if I did it when I was tired after not eating, I can do it anytime. And now they really get that momentum going. So so what we, uh, so now we're actually, uh, so, you know, COVID threw a wrench in the plans of expansion, uh, but on the other hand, it, it uh, you know, let us expand virtually. And so now we do the remote fasting with people from, from everywhere. Um, so yeah, if you, if that's something that, that makes sense and you want to do that, then, then yeah, you just go to fastingescape.com and, and read about it. There's a, the, the links are pretty clear as far as how to get started. Um, and some people have actually done it uh, in an Airbnb. So I've got, I've got uh, people that will tell me, that they, there's no way they can do it at home because they got kids running around, you know, mother-in-law, father-in-law, wife, husband, whatever. So they actually book an Airbnb in their neighborhood. So they can at least, you know, their husband or wife can come visit them and they do that. They set everything up and then, uh, then we're able to do this remote fast with them uh, very easily and the refeed. You know what I was thinking? Cause yesterday, Dr. McDougall was on the show mm -hmm. and he's talking about how much he loves teaching his program virtually now mm -hmm. and that he really doesn't want to go back to in person because it really helps his patients because- mm -hmm even though the in-person program was great that they had the food made for them, they're actually learning how to do the food, which is yep. going to be an important step when they get home. But I was thinking with in-home fasting, what stops a person from cheating? Cause they're in their own environment. You, you know, like when you're yep. in, like, you're not, you're the warden and they're kind of locked right. up, but right. if you're in your own home, wouldn't it be kind of easy to like, if you got a craving to just kind of that's a really good question. And, and this is where I didn't actually think the remote fasting would, I thought that I thought like you, I thought, well, you know what? I don't really want to do this remote fasting because I have no control over like here. I can like snarl at them and they, and they just know that I'm going to be mad if they go into the pantry. Okay. But, but at home there's, there's complete freedom, but it actually surprised me. And patients actually have been telling me, uh, participants have been telling me that just knowing that we're going to be talking every day is enough. And they lose their hunger within a couple of days. And just that accountability is just very helpful. It also, I feel it's like empowering. You know, one of the, one of the principles that, that I, I want to make, I want to help people become their own best doctors as much as they can and become self-reliant. And so if we, they know that, listen, you know, I I'm doing this fast and I'm, I'm committed to it. And, and so we help them through that. Um, I've had exactly zero people sneak into their own pantry during a fast and break their fast. Okay. That's amazing. I, I've had people that will say that they're starting to get a little bit tempted uh, because they're tired and they got work coming up and they're not sure. And so we might break the fast early, but, but I really haven't had people who are, you know, in a, in a mess where they just, you know, ate something on day five because they were too hungry. The hunger typically disappears. We also, you know, we're not just talking on day one. We are talking a couple of days before the fast and also, you know, days or weeks out before the fast as well. And just, you know, one thing we actually like to do is a couple of days before the fast begins, it's like, okay, you're going to clean out your whole pantry. Okay. Of all the junk food and all you're going to be there is whole natural foods. We're going to do the chef AJ protocol. Okay. And clean out everything. And then also what people will do during the first few days before they start fasting is they now will organize the closet that they haven't organized for 20 years. And all of a sudden now their brains relaxed. Now they can focus on what it is they need to focus. So yeah, I, I think it's a really good question. I had the same exact question in my head, but I've, I've since been proven wrong. 
Uh, I mean, I'm sure I'll have people that may once in a while do that, but, but we really try to push that, that even if you do break the fast somehow, there's only whole foods in your house by the time you're fasting. And so we really set them up for, for success afterwards. That's great. Here's a question from Christy. What was the youngest patient you ever had at True North? Doesn't somebody have to be at least 18 to fast? Yeah, I don't, I don't exactly know. I know I've had, I've had sometimes parents will drag their kids here to Fasting Escape and also at True North uh, when I was, in, uh, was working at True North. But here at Fasting Escape, I've had, I've had a couple of people, uh, their parents you know, came in with them. They ate the diet. A few of them even tried to short fast. Uh, but I'm not all excited about fasting kids uh, for long periods of time. My general attitude is if the kid is sick, then, you know, fast, you know, they can fast for a day or two. Uh, but long term, what we really need to do is, is instill good habits and keep them out of the pleasure trap by way of, of, uh, of, of a good environment. Now, that's going to be easier said than done, because nowadays environment, maybe even, even when we were teenagers, it's like there's a lot of junk food all over the place. So. Well, getting out of the pleasure trap is tough. Staying yep. out is almost impossible. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. I saw a question here. Oh, uh, Cassia says, does eczema improve with a water fast? Yeah, actually, I, I, I've worked with several people with eczema and it can typically go through an arc where it might flare up during a fast, but it typically does improve. Now, when afterwards, if it does flare up, we want to make sure if we identify certain triggers, sometimes sunshine can improve it. Sometimes it can make it worse. Animal foods can make it worse. So we want to, the, the strategy would be to give your body the best opportunity to heal itself. And eczema uh, responds really well. Another skin condition that's similar to eczema, but it's not the same thing, but it's very similar is psoriasis and psoriasis responds beautifully to water fasting. In fact, many, many patients have had very severe psoriasis. I had one lady who had such bad psoriasis on her hand that she was embarrassed shaking hands with people. Uh, and she did a 16 day water fast and, uh, and cleared it almost completely up. Uh, and then at True North Health Foundation, we recently had uh, the, they, they, they published an article of a plaque, severe plaque psoriasis where, it, where they did a 13 day water fast. And all that was left after this silver scaly rash was just a, a just smooth skin with just a red discoloration. So yes, uh, eczema, uh, psoriasis, these all respond very well to water fasting and a clean diet afterwards. Nice. There's a question from May. Can water fasting help with water retention? It depends on where that water retention is from. So most water retention that I've seen is going to be through eating too much salt. Uh, but if you've got something like congestive heart failure, which may also be responding well with fasting or other, uh, we really have to evaluate you. So uh, that that's where, uh, you know, consultations uh, for individual things like, uh, so we can really do a whole complete picture as to what's going on. Uh, and that can involve myself. Uh, so we do this before we determine if you're a good candidate for water fasting, or if you're on medications and you need a medical consultation, then we do that with Dr. Thomas, who will be on next week as well. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's a really excellent question. You can you know, get in touch with me through my website and we can kind of take a look and see if that would fit. Great. Jesse wants to know, can a person with both atrial fibrillation and a slow irregular heartbeat fast safely? Uh, that would require an evaluation because we, in, as a general rule, we don't want to be fasting someone with AFib. Uh, it's, it, we, it's too many things can go wrong during a fast. Your blood gets a little thicker. We don't want there to be an irregular heartbeat, but the patients that I've fasted with AFib, we've done a modified fast. So maybe like broth, you know, two broths a day and one juice, for example. And that way we're not completely uh, disrupting the body's, uh, the body's ability. But we'd also want to take a look at what is the current diet looking like? Because I've also had a few patients with AFib where they come in and they've been, they're not, not been eating all that great, but we feed them a diet of just salad and fruits and vegetables and starches. And I'm checking their pulse. And I remember this one clearly is the AFib was skipping 12 times a minute. And every day I'm coming in twice a day to check their, check their pulse. And it's like, goes from 10, then eight, and then six, and then four. So <clears throat> that would be something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is with remote fasting, we don't want to do something like AFib because, because uh, unless you have a doctor support there who can check your pulse and see if it's actually regular or not. So that would be uh, for those, uh, that's where something I would, might recommend like an inpatient experience like at True North or Dr. UN Center. Yep. Uh, here's a quick question from Linda. If you don't have any adverse side effects from water fasting, how do you determine when to stop the fast? Well, it's a good question. We don't, we, we actually, the, the goal is actually to fast as long as necessary, but as short as possible. So if someone's just fasting just for the heck of it, you know, just because they just want to get some, some, some rest, 
then there's really no, no need to go a super long time. So you can pick an arbitrary date, five days, 10 days, whatever it is. But if you're trying to resolve a particular health condition, like high blood pressure from the lady who act, asked early, we essentially fast you until the blood pressure goes down and stays down. Okay. And that can be a big range, sometimes five days, sometimes 25 days, okay. Sometimes longer. So it's, it's different for everybody. Uh, but in general, if you're, if you're feeling fine and it's time to break the fast, just as far as your life goes, fine. But if, if you're feeling good and you want to, you know, go as long as possible, then we get regular blood work on you, check your vitals. And then when those start to be, uh, start to look like they're off, uh, then we know that we're, it's time to break the fast soon. Mm. Well, can people fast from anywhere in the world? Uh, I have worked with people in different continents, all the way up through different continents. So this is a consultation basis as we are, we are helping you go through a fast uh, safely. So offering my experience on that and, and, you know, advising you as far as, you know, what blood work to look at. Uh, we do, we, we do help you out with the blood work uh, and, and kind of going through that, but we, you and I are talking every single day during your, before the fast during the fast and then after the fast and kind of keeping you on track and answering any questions you might have. And then we also do live Zoom talks uh, once, twice a week uh, on different topics. Uh, and then you can see everybody else fasting. Sometimes people like to chat in the chat room and, uh, and kind of make some virtual friends there too. Ever fast anyone in Antarctica? No, not yet. I don't think they have phone service there. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have cell phone service, but I have talked to a few people where, where we had to, we had to use some sort of a international calling, calling thing because the, the landline and the, the time zones are, are kind of off, but, but yeah, it's, it, it could be done from anywhere as a consultation basis. So that is something. What do you think the biggest mistake people make when they fast? I think that there's too much activity going on sometimes. And I've seen this at True North, sometimes at Fasting Escape. Uh, it's a little smaller here at Fasting Escape. It's more intimate. So a lot of times people are just resting and, and they're not doing as much activity. But I do think that that uh, that one pitfall you can get into is that you feel really good. People feel oftentimes if they've been on medications, if they've had, you know, if they felt run down, they start to feel better during a fast. And so they start to do a lot of activity. They finally get to, they finally have the energy to go out walking. So they do a lot of activity, a lot of energy expenditure. And that, that, that really does limit their fast uh, length and also uses up energy uh, redirects it towards the exercise and activity rather than the healing aspect. And the other mistake is, is anytime you're refeeding, you want to make sure that you're doing it slowly. So uh, this doesn't happen so much in the remote, remote uh, fasting. Uh, but I know it's funny enough, it used to happen uh, at Fasting Escape and a few times at True North when I was working there, um, that, that sometimes people will just like walk off site and go to like a grocery store or go somewhere and they'll eat something off the plan. Uh, because, you know, that I don't know if it's anything to do with the programs itself. It's more that I think people, some people are just very addicted and it's very hard to do it. Um, and so, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, there's all kinds of different reasons for people to do that. But I'd say we, were, we really want to be strict with the refeed. I remember when I was working at True North during the holiday extravaganza all those years, you know, they used to keep the kitchen open at night. People could, you know, I don't know, get lettuce or whatever. And I remember there was this guy that was fasting and like all the cashews were missing and he was fasting and he kept going in there and eating cashews. Cashews are expensive. So they started locking the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, can fasting get rid of lipomas? Arlene wants to know. I've seen it really get rid of lipomas. I, I have seen it in practice. You have to do a very long fast and it depends on how thin you are to begin with uh, because you, you do, you do have to go long fast, but I have seen it before. You know, my husband had one and he's very thin. So it looked really funny on him. Like it was about the size of a golf, uh, of a tennis ball, half mm -hmm. the size, like imagine cutting it in half on his back and he was vegan, but when he went oil free, it like disappeared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating what the body can do if we give it the right, if we give it the right uh, circumstances. Yeah. Kim says, will a fast help with GERD? Yeah, we, we want to actually look at, you know, GERD can be a number of reasons, most often due to diet, but sometimes people are eating clean diet and they're still having reflux. So we would actually expect that during a water fast that it would calm down in the beginning. And then every so often it may actually get, get more, more pronounced during the water fast, and which is surprising because nobody's eating anything during a fast. So why would it go up? Um, so what it does, we just kind of give the body a complete break and then watch what happens. And usually after the fast, uh, it, it actually comes down quite a bit. Yeah, great. Wayne says, what are the benefits of a juice fast versus a water fast? And will it help with weight loss? Yeah. What's going to help weight loss in general, long-term is a long-term strategy. Okay. And that strategy is a whole plant foods diet. Uh, and, uh, you know, with 
potatoes, rice, beans, salads, fruits, vegetables, steamed vegetables, cooked vegetables, that's going to help long-term. So where a, a water fast, for example, can, can play a role is to break the negative cycle of the, the addictive uh, tendencies and also give your taste buds a break so that they actually are more sensitive. And so that the whole fruits and vegetables, potatoes, rice, and beans are actually tasty. They actually taste really good. So you want to eat them. And so that can sometimes require a long fast. Okay. Now let's suppose somebody doesn't want to do a water fast for whatever reason, or let's say they're contraindicated. Maybe they're on medications at this point. If they're overweight, they, they might be on certain medications. Well, in that case, we don't want to do a water fast. We would want to modify the fast and do a juice fast. Okay. And that can do the similar, it's not quite completely a fast because it does disrupt the ketosis process. There's a little bit more muscle loss, but it's still just as good when it comes to breaking the cycle. Okay. Where you're only drinking juice for a few days and you get those taste buds nice and sensitive, and now you can get back on fruits and vegetables. So I see water fasting as kind of the, the best version of the detox process. And then juice fasting is the next best thing. If, if that's all we can do, if we can't do water fasting. Nice. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, you're a doctor, so there's going to be a bunch of questions. So feel free to stop anytime. Yeah. And, like. and the thing is, is next week, Dr. Thomas, my medical director, she's a, she's a medical doctor at a Loma Linda university, and she's going to be on with me and uh, she, with, uh, we're going to be on with chef AJ again next week. So if you have more questions for yeah, her, let's, let's save some, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, just, she does she... remote consultations from people all over the country as well. So nice. So but you're not even allowed to brush your teeth when you fast. Is that true? You can can. You just don't want to use uh, toothpaste or mouthwash or minty dental floss or whatnot. Got it. Right. Yeah, it's just water. <laughs> wow. Well, it yeah. sounds like a miserable experience. That Absolutely is. But <laughs> at the end of the tunnel is people feel better. And, and if they feel better, they sometimes forgive me for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, that is really the main reason I take care of myself because I don't want to have to do anything <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, had a, I struggle with the juice fast at True North. I was so hungry, but people say that sometimes water fasting is easier because they don't get as hungry. Yes. That's, that's one of the main things as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you are just a wealth of information. I, I would imagine you are one of the experts on this. So thank you so much. Couldn't have done it without you, Chef AJ. I, I just really appreciate all the support that you've given me with Fasting Escape and, and when I was at True North. I remember when we first met at True North. So. Like you're, your gra you're your grandma's grandson. Your Rose's grandson. Yeah, she, <laughs> we she had, had such a great time on the show. Oh, I remember she that was like the adorable. highlight of her oh highlight of her God. career. So, I, you know, you know, I was on um, a podcast yesterday. And, you know, I've done it Friday, it'll be a thousand shows. So while well, every show is special, she goes, well, you know, what shows were the most memorable? And it's always ones with the, with the people that are a little bit older, you know, mm -hmm. like Elaine Lelaine, your grandma, Deborah Seke, who I had Sunday, who's a hundred, because they, there's such wisdom from mm -hmm the people that are older than us and I am going to be them one day soon. So <laughs> you don't look at, you, <laughs> well, you're uh, eating plant-based. You look great. I know <laughs> it's just, I do it. I do it for vanity. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gershfeld. And we look forward to having you back next week with Dr. Thomas. So if people really want to do this remotely, they can, they can contact either of you or both of you and, and get started. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. And again, oh, save those questions for next week. Dr. Thomas is a wealth of information. She's just got, she explains things wonderfully. So so uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next week. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have a very fun cooking demo from Lauren Burnick of The Well Elephant. She's going to be making New York style Reuben sandwiches two ways. Two ways, Dr. Gershold, meaning probably the regular vegan way and the way that Chef AJ would eat it. <laughs> That's what I'm guessing two ways is. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.